please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and this morning we will pick up the reading from verse 11. Ephesians 2 verse 11, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for this precious word which we acknowledge is the very word of God open before us this morning. Thank you, Father, for inspiring the Apostle Paul to write down these tremendous mysteries. And we pray that you would give us ears to hear this morning. May you give us receptive hearts, the hearts that the Lord Jesus described as the fertile soil in the parable of the sower. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1871, the archaeologist Charles Clement Ganneau discovered a slab of limestone near the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And this slab turned out to be an ancient warning sign written in Greek. The warning went like this. No foreigner may enter within the barrier and enclosure around the temple Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his consequent death. Now last week we had a look at why there was such a serious divide between the Jews and the Gentiles, or the Jews and the rest of the nations. This ancient limestone warning notice illustrates once again the enormous tension between God's covenant people and the rest of the world. And this divide wasn't a small matter. It wasn't like the the divide uh, between Manchester United and Liverpool supporters, although some of you may disagree with that. (laughs) But for the Jews, this was a matter of life and death, or we could say a matter of eternal life and eternal death. Now, Paul is not reminding the Ephesian church of their Gentileness to make them feel unwelcome or excluded. He is not trying to make them feel like second-class citizens. No, Paul's main point in this whole passage is that those Gentiles who believe in Christ are wonderfully included into God's covenant people. So what does this inclusion mean? mean? Well, we're going to look at four main points about our inclusion this morning. And these uh, these points are printed out in your bulletin. Firstly, we're going to look at the inclusion clarified. Secondly, we'll look at the inclusion through Christ. Thirdly, we'll look at the inclusion as citizens. Fourthly, at the inclusion as co-heirs. Let's look firstly at the inclusion clarified. Now we're going to do something which may seem a bit odd at first, but I'm sure it will make sense very shortly. Let's turn to Ephesians 3. We're going to start at Ephesians 3 and then we're going to work backwards into chapter 2. Ephesians 3 verses 1 to 6. 
Paul says, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you, Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Three times in this passage, Paul refers to a mystery which had been revealed to him. And it had been revealed to him for the sake of his ministry to the Gentiles. Now friends, don't be confused by the term mystery. Don't be mystified by it. Uh, in, in popular language, mystery refers to something that people don't understand. Uh, some people like reading murder mysteries. And in these murder mystery novels, there are these crimes which are hard to solve. And you wonder, where is the story going? Who is the criminal? And so mystery in our language has come to mean something that is hard to understand, something that's puzzling. But that's not how Paul uses the term mystery here. Paul is not saying, oh, this is such a hard thing to understand. Who can understand it? Well, let's try our best. No, Paul is saying this mystery is something that was hidden, but it's now been revealed. He's talking about a great truth which God has clarified to his people. Now, this mystery was given to help resolve this terrible tension within the early church between Jews and Gentiles. But uh, before we get into the details of the mystery, I just want to highlight how urgently the clarification was needed. The very foundations of the church were at stake here. To get a, a sense of that, let's turn to Acts 21. Acts chapter 21. Acts 21 from verse 27. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him, that is Paul, in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people, meaning the people of God, and the law, and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, Word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. So friends, do you see how urgently the clarification was needed? I mean, poor Trophimus. Poor Trophimus the Ephesian may very well have been one of the founding members of the church in Ephesus. He was an early Greek convert. Can you imagine how he felt? I mean, he had just recently come to faith. In Israel's Messiah, Jesus. He had left his former paganism behind to worship and serve the true and the living God of Israel. He had been told by Paul, a Jew, that he was a fellow citizen with Israel. A co-heir with Israel or a saint or a holy one. But now, as soon as he comes near the temple, apparently, the covenant people of God want to kill Paul. For desecrating God's holy place. Paul and Trophimus may have even walked past that ancient limestone warning sign near the temple. Foreigners, stay away or die. Now you can just imagine what an effect this had on the early church. 
The Gentile Christians must have felt extremely rejected by God's covenant people. They must have felt like total outsiders. Now, this is why the Apostle Paul had to reassure them about their status in the eyes of God. Over and over again in Ephesians 2 and 3, Paul reminds them that they are truly part of the people of God. And he reminds them over and over again that he is not saying this on his own authority. I mean, that wouldn't work for a second. Too many people have too many false opinions about all sorts of things. They needed to hear from God about their status. They needed to hear from God Almighty, the Lord and Savior of the nation of Israel, where they stood. And Paul says God had spoken. He says their inclusion has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Ephesians 3 verse 5. Now dear friends, there's a very simple but profound lesson in here for all of us. We must get clarity on these issues from God. There is a lot of talk these days about Israel and about the church and about how the two relate to one another. And there is so much ignorance, so much confusion, so many false opinions. But God has clarified his plan for Israel and believing Gentiles. And if we don't get it, we will end up totally confused like the unbelieving Jews of Paul's time. Without the clarity of God's word, everything will seem upside down and back to front to us. So we need to pay attention more than ever to what God has clearly revealed. Now with that said, what did the Spirit say about the relationship between Israel and these believing Gentiles? How on earth did the two fit together? This brings us to the next main point, our inclusion through Christ. Let's turn back to Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2 from verse 12. Paul says, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now Paul says, the Gentiles, the believing Gentiles, like Trophimus the Ephesian, were once separated, alienated, strangers, and were far off, but now they have been brought near. But how? Paul says they were brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. It cost the Lord Jesus Christ his very life on the cross to purchase a place for believing Gentiles in the holy nation of God. But is that all? I mean, surely it's more complicated than that, Paul. Aren't we included by the blood of Christ plus something else i mean the, the jews were wondering what about circumcision paul what about all of the laws of moses paul how could you just dismiss all of that well have a very careful look at verse 14 and onwards paul says for he that's jesus himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Now friends, what Paul says here is nothing short of revolutionary. Paul is saying the blood of Jesus Christ is so effective and it is so sufficient that it alone brings us near, sanctifies us, and joins us to the holy nation of God. Now we must just try and appreciate how radically controversial this was for the Jews at that time. It's no wonder they wanted to kill Paul. For millennia, the commandments and ordinances which he refers to here played a crucial role in determining who was in and who was out of God's people. The Lord told Abraham, 
that if he did not circumcise his sons, they would be cut off from the people of God. And the Lord told Moses that if anyone rejected the law, they too would be cut off. This is how people were formerly brought near or kept away. And most Jews still think this way today. I mean, for example, just listen to how the world-renowned rabbi Menachem Posner explains how to become a Jew. He says this, Conversion to Judaism has a few components which are undertaken under the supervision of, a, of an established Beit Din. Now, in case you don't know what a Beit Din is, it's a formal Jewish court of law or religious law. And these courts are typically composed of at least three uh, Jewish men who are Torah experts, one of which has to be an Orthodox rabbi. So what are the requirements? Well, the rabbi says, firstly, one must accept the yoke of the commandments. When you convert, you must verbalize your commitment to live in accordance with all of the Torah's 613 commandments as they are explained in Torah law. It is not enough to commit to some or even most of the precepts. A convert must commit to every single one of them. Which is ironic because of how many they can't keep these days. He says also this needs to be done out of a sincere desire to serve God as a Jew. Not because of any ulterior motive such as the desire to marry a Jewish woman or a Jewish man. Secondly, one must be immersed in the mikvah. A mikvah is a pool of natural water, usually rainwater. At your conversion, you will dunk into the spiritually cleansing bath. It is at this moment that you will accept the Torah upon yourself. Thirdly, males must be circumcised. But if you were circumcised as a child, a symbolic drawing of blood is all that will be done at this point. And then fourthly, when the temple stood in Jerusalem, a convert would bring a special sacrifice to the holy temple in Jerusalem. When the temple is rebuilt, may it be speedily done in our days, converts will again bring sacrifices. Now friends, Paul says this was the old way. This was the old covenant way of determining who was in and who was out. But then came Jesus, the Messiah. And Paul tells us that Jesus kept the whole law for us. Jesus fulfilled all that the law required on our behalf. All of it, civilly, ceremonially, morally. Jesus didn't just chuck the law out, he fulfilled it for us. And then he died for all the laws that we broke and that we would break. And because of that, all we need to do to be included in God's holy nation is to put our trust in Jesus Christ. There are no other hoops to jump through, says Paul. No physical circumcision is necessary. No sacrifices needed to be offered at the temple because Christ is our sacrifice. No dietary laws need to be followed. No, only faith in Jesus shed blood. That's all. And this applies to Jews and to Gentiles. There, is, there are no two ways which you can choose from. It's not the law or Christ, if you like. Paul says, faith in Jesus alone. Do you have that faith, friends? Do you have that bold confidence in Jesus Christ alone? Or to put it differently, do you believe that we are included into God's holy people by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone? Do you believe that? Because that's the gospel. That's what Paul is telling about us about here, and it's absolutely wonderful. Now, Paul says, the believing Gentiles, like you and I, are brought near. That's his specific language. We are brought near. But what does this mean? How near have we been brought? Well, this brings us to our next main point. 
the inclusion as citizens. The inclusion as citizens. Let's have a look at Ephesians 2 verse 19. Ephesians 2 verse 19. Paul says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, or more literally with the holy ones and members of the household of God. Now throughout the Old Testament, a clear line was drawn between the stranger or sojourner and the Israelite citizen. For example, early on in Exodus, Exodus 12 verse 48, Moses says this about the Passover, which is one of the central feasts of the Jews. He says, if a stranger shall sojourn with you and keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, then he may come near. So you see where Paul's borrowing his language in Ephesians. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. Now, friends, we see these terms, stranger and sojourner, come up over and over again in the Old Testament. There were people uh, who would visit Israel for various reasons. Perhaps they even lived in Israel or traded in Israel or had their holidays in Israel. Who knows? But the fact remained they were not Israel. As long as they remained uncircumcised, as long as they did not submit to the whole law of Moses, they were not citizens. They were just guests. Now with that in mind, have a look at Ephesians 2.19 again. So then you, believing Gentiles, are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the holy ones, with the household of God. Now, dear friends, Paul is saying we Gentiles are not these traveling uh, strangers or guests, and we're certainly not illegal aliens. We are fellow citizens. We don't merely have Israeli visas which need to be review, uh, reviewed and renewed. No, we have full citizenship. Now, I know this might seem very confusing to you because if you take the letter to the Ephesians, to the Israeli embassy in Pretoria, and you say, look, it says here, I'm a citizen, they'll laugh at you. <laughs> so what on earth does it mean that we are fellow citizens? Well, friends, it clearly does not apply to the nation state of Israel in this world. Because the nation state of Israel in 2024 does not believe in Jesus Christ. If they did, they would welcome us. So what does it mean to be a fellow citizen? Who are we fellow citizens with? Well, Paul helps us in Galatians 4. In Galatians 4, verses 25 and 26, Paul compares and contrasts two Jerusalems. The one he calls the present Jerusalem, which re represents the Jewish nation on earth, and the other he calls the Jerusalem above. And he says the present Jerusalem represents the earthly Jewish nation which is in slavery to the law and unbelief, whereas the heavenly Jerusalem represents the free children of the promise who belong to Jesus Christ. In Galatians 4 verse 26, Paul says that the Jerusalem above is free and she is our mother. So, dear friends, we are children and we are citizens of the Jerusalem above. Or to use Paul's terms in Philippians 3 verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven. We are Israeli citizens who are recognized by the Jewish capital in heaven. And our citizenship in heaven is far more imp important than having uh, an Israeli citizenship on earth. Why? Well, because you can have an Israeli citizenship on earth, but that does not guarantee you salvation and eternal life. There are many, many unbelieving Jews today who reject Christ, and they think they're part of the holy nation of God, but in reality they are cut off. But if you are a citizen of the heavenly Jerusalem, the Jerusalem above, you are saved. You are truly part of God's people. 
So friends, that's how near we have been brought by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not near as in, oh, you're just a, a cousin or just a friend of Israel. No, we are, Paul says, fellow citizens. And so we all have dual citizenship. Yes, we have citizenship with nations in this world. But far more importantly, we Christians are citizens of God's heavenly nation. Now, because of this, Paul says we are also co-heirs with Israel, which brings us to the final main point. Uh, the inclusion as co-heirs. Let's turn to Ephesians 3 verse 6. Paul uses another uh, fellow uh, word here. It's just said we were, we are fellow citizens, but now he says, Ephesians 3 verse 6, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. Now, as I said earlier, we say Gentiles do not merely have an Israeli visa, we have citizenship. But there's more. We also have adoption papers. In the Old Covenant, Israel is called God's son, and he was promised a great inheritance. Now, Paul says, we will inherit whatever Israel was promised to inherit. We are co-heirs. We are fellow heirs. So how have we become co-heirs? What will we inherit? Well, Paul explains it to us very clearly in Romans 4. It's worth it if we turn there together. Romans 4. I know we're jumping around a lot today, but uh, I trust it's worthwhile. Romans 4, from verse 13. Paul says, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world, did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. But the law brings wrath, sorry, for the law brings wrath. But where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations, or Gentiles, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations or Gentiles. So, no, sorry, as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. So father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had father Abraham. And I am one of them and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Well, that's a sweet children's song. And it's true if you are a Christian. You are a child, you are a son and daughter of Abraham. In Romans 4 verse 16, Paul says, Those who share the faith of Abraham are his children. And in Galatians 3 verse 29, he says, And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So we, Gentiles, have been included into this wonderful Abrahamic family through Jesus Christ. Once again, not through the law, Paul says very clearly, but directly through faith in Jesus Christ. It's as simple as that. Now with that said, what will we inherit? Well, Romans 4 verse 13. It's very interesting. Paul says, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> Paul says the world in Greek, cosmos. Now the Greek translated, uh, the Greek word translated world uh, is cosmos. And Paul had been using that word in Romans up until chapter 4 many times. And every time he uses it, it means the world in the broader sense. It doesn't just mean a part of the world, it means the world. 
Now, you might be scratching your head at this point thinking, where did God say to Abraham, you can have the world? I mean, even our Sunday school children know he was promised the promised land, right? That's a little part of the Middle East. That's the land of Canaan. That's all we know about. So, so what's this all about? Well, our Reformed Baptist brother, Thomas Schreiner, who's one of the most brilliant biblical scholars in the world, wrote a magnificent commentary on Romans. And I don't usually like to quote commentaries at length in the pulpit, uh, but I think it's worthwhile this time just because of how much clarity he brings to this point. Here's how he explains why Paul says he would be heir of the world. Tom says, examining the Old Testament, we find no explicit statement that Abraham would become heir of the world. God had promised Abraham that he would have a multitude of descendants and the land of Canaan and that all the nations would be blessed through him. Nonetheless, the idea that Abraham and his offspring would become heirs of the world is not foreign to the Old Testament. The entire earth, will be the possession of the promised Abrahamic king in David's line, according to Psalm 2, verse 8. He will reign from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth, Psalm 72, verse 8. The whole world will be filled with Israel's fruit, Isaiah 27, verse 6. And Israel's rule will be universal, Isaiah 54, verses 2 to 3. The book of Jubilees deduce from the Abrahamic covenant that Jews will inherit the world. If universal blessing for all peoples is offered by God, then this is another way of saying that God will reclaim the whole world, which was lost through Adam's sin. The universal character of the promise is sounded forth in the rest of the Old Testament, and Paul's view that the promise includes the whole world was virtually a shared belief among Second, Second Temple Jews. Do you see what's at stake here, friends? This is magnificent. God's inheritance for Abraham was always way more glorious than that tiny little strip of land in the Middle East. God's plan was always way bigger, way better. Abraham was ultimately promised the world with the Middle East thrown in. And Jesus Christ Abraham's son and our Messiah will fulfill this promise by reclaiming the world to himself. He will receive the inheritance of the nations. Now Paul is telling us that we Gentiles who believe in Jesus are co-heirs. We will not inherit anything different. We will not inherit anything less. We are fellow citizens, we are fellow heirs, we are offspring of Abraham, we share in the commonwealth of Israel, and all of that because we belong to Israel's Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now let me end by making this just a bit more personal for us. Uh, one of the most basic human desires is the desire to belong. We want to belong to a family or to a church or to a nation in which we will feel accepted and loved and supported and defended. We long to belong. And, and many of us here have felt the pain of exclusion. Some of us here have, have felt the pain of exclusion based on race or class or education, or whatever else. The modern psychologists are telling us that the, the, the feeling of, of exclusion is, is registered in our brains as a physical pain. It's a devastating feeling. Just think of how Trophimus the Ephesian would have felt when he was taken on that day near the temple. And when he was so thoroughly rejected by the Jews, but we all long to belong to some people, somewhere. And now Paul is telling us that we, believing Gentiles, belong. We belong to the most important family in the world, and we belong to the most important nation in the world. And we belong because of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the only true Savior of the world. 
we have been included into that magnificent holy tree which Paul talks about in Romans 11. God planted that tree. He causes it to grow. He prunes it. He grafts branches into it like us. And he gives it eternal life. We belong to this holy tree or this holy nation. And with that, we will inherit what they've been promised to inherit. All through our conquering priest, King Jesus Christ. May we never ever forget what amazing privileges these are. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for uh, this tremendous teaching on who we are, this tremendous mystery which Paul refers to, which has been entrusted to him for the sake of the Gentiles, for the sake of, of us here. We thank you for the truth that we are included. We are included through Christ. We are included as co-heirs. We are included as citizens. What a magnificent privilege that is. We didn't deserve it. We couldn't earn our place among your holy people. We could never, ever do anything to sanctify ourselves. We could never do anything to make ourselves welcome in your household. And yet, by grace through Christ, you've welcomed us in. What a wonderful privilege. Please guide us in these times, Lord. We know that there are many different opinions about the church and about Israel and how the two relate together. Lord, we pray that you would give us grace to see what Paul has revealed here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.